All right, you guys, good morning. So functions. The first thing we're going to do is... Hey, so do you want me to do my presentation today or do yes. you want me to do it? Oh my okay. gosh, thank you so much. I always do this. Chris, take it away. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so in case we haven't met already, um, I'm Chris. Uh, my presentation today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how I got started in uh, playing poker and I... Uh, and. I will share with you guys the secret to winning at poker, <laughs> if there is one. Um, I started playing poker about, uh, well, a little over 10 years ago. I started playing professionally about eight or nine years ago. Um, I started at Indian Casino. I was just local. Um, and back then, they really didn't have Hold'em um, around at that time. There might be a few games occasionally, but really it was just seven-card stud. Um, if you see poker on TV today, um, that's the a poker variation called Hold'em. Uh, um, uh, even when I was younger at that age, I, I realized that poker was a beatable game. Uh, the When you go to a casino, all the other games are against the casino, and it, it's impossible to win in the long run. Um, poker is different. It's played against other players, and it just has – a small fee um, called the rake that the casino takes out, really just trying to break even and pay their dealers administration um, for that poker room. Uh, uh, they also hope that poker players will also go play their casino games, which is where they make their money. Uh, I, um, so I wanted to learn as much as I possibly could about poker strategy. Um, and back then there was really only a few books out there that were kind of okay. Um, and kind of gave you just a general overview of, of how to play hands. And there's really no true way to get good at poker without analysis. And before doing calculations on um, calculating EV, which, which we'll learn later, is uh, there, poker analysis looked like two people talking or maybe more than two people talking around a poker table about a particular poker hand or poker situation saying, well, I think this is the best play because of this, or um, no, I think you should do this um, uh, because of this reason. And uh, I found um, uh, online poker forums, which I think really created modern poker strategy and talking with others and, uh, um, and really people making valid points using calculations over time. So if I can figure out how to share my screen here, I will uh, share with you what is, what, not, what is not good poker strategy first. There you go, perfect. Okay, so can you see this YouTube video? I'm assuming you guys all can. So this is what poker is not. <laughs> There's no sound, so do you want to? Like, no, it's fine. So if you guys are confused of what, what's actually happening here, you should be. Um, what is happening here is Matt Damon is making a $30,000 poker decision based on how John Malkovich is eating his Oreos. So that is not good poker strategy and in general tells can actually hurt you if you rely on them. And what you should be doing instead is do, making a calculation. Um, and what we do in poker is and there's different ways to do this but um what we do is we want to calculate the expected value um, or ev which is just the in the long run this play is expected to net us x amount of dollars so a plus ev play would be uh a play that is expected to be profitable in the long run, and a negative EV play is expected to lose us money in the long run. So on line one, this is the EV um, calculation here, which is just the percentage of whatever this given 
hand is in this particular time um, that we have to win times our the money we stand to win minus the percentage um, chance that we could lose and times the uh, the risk that we we have here so um, on line four and four through seven here I kind of this is a pretty popular um, situation to to explain EV but let's say like someone came to us and wanted to wager three dollars um, or give us three dollars if it lands on if a coin lands on heads and we would have to pay them one dollar if a coin landed on tails so um, these just represent this point five here on line 10 represents the 50 percent chance it lands on heads um, line 11 is the three dollars we would end up winning from this person and line 12 you can input it manually or you could um, just uh, um, since the percentage win and percentage loss have to equal to 100, um, it would just be one or 100% minus the percentage win. So that's 50%. And then um, line 13 represents the amount that we're risking. So if anyone wants to unmute and take a guess at what this EV calculation would give us per one coin flip. or put it in the chat. Perfect, yeah, Ben. So the EV calculation is one, and um, if you run this, you'll see EV of this play is one. And basically all it's doing is taking the 0.5 from, from line 10, multiplying it by three, which gives you 1.5, and then taking 0.5, um, the 50% chance times our, our risk, which is 0.5 and subtracting in the end, 1.5 minus 0.5, and that's our EV. So I won't go too far into it, but I do just wanna show you guys a example of what we actually, a poker tool that we actually use. Um, if it loads. <laughs> So uh, well, it's not going to load, but oh, here it goes. So we, this is an example of a poker analysis, and I won't go into it because I'll have to define a lot of different poker terms, but um, if we had three two and we both had stacks of 20, um, you could actually calculate the EV based on what our opponent's um, range is. So if he was only going to call us. Um, a certain amount of time, like say 25% of the time, uh, we can calculate what our expected EV is if we push all of our chips in, and that EV is 0.58. So that is all for today. <laughs> Any questions? Is that legal? Like, can you actually use tools like this when you play poker? <laughs> so um, it is legal. These are tools to help you um, calculate. Um, it's not legal and it's also not really practical to, to play, to use this while you're playing. Generally, most poker players that are played professionally, um, like myself, will play somewhere around like 20 to 25 tables at a time. So you not you don't really have a chance to like calculate at the same time. And, and really for the most part, these, these are pretty basic calculations that you should already kind of understand and know. And these are, these are some, this is the analysis that we do away from the tables. So, but yeah, you can use them. They are legal, just not to be used at the same time while playing. Oh, wow. Can you how working 25 tables at a single time works? Sure. So I, I don't really have a way of representing it on the screen, but how it works is. Not mathematically. I mean, just like physically yeah, in the casino. Sure. You're like, it's supposed to be in 20 places at the same time. How does that work out? So, no, so um, with online poker, um, all of, you'd be able to like register for all of these tables, right? All of these tournaments, all of these cash games, whatever it is. And we have um, sort of scripts or even programs that will stack all of the poker tables onto each other. And when it's your turn to play, it will, it's in queue. So it will pop up. You would select bet, raise, fold, whatever it is. I used actually like a, a remote, like sort of like a PlayStation or Xbox remote. And so one button was hold, one button was 
raise 2.5x or whatever it is, and they're all in queue. So you'd hit raise, the next one pop up, you'd hit fold, you'd hit fold, you'd hit fold, and they would just all pop up in queue. Do you feel like playing that way ruins the game? I mean, at that point, it's just basically, you're just like purely looking at st statistics for the entire time you're playing. But when I play poker, I play with my friends, I've got beers, I'm having fun, I'm talking to people. It's more of like an engagement there and less about the cards. I mean, sure. Um, I would say that it's just two different things. When you're playing with other people, um, like socially, it, it is a social experience, it, it's a social game. When you're playing 20 tables at a time, you're playing competitively. You're, it's, you're playing to win. <laughs> what poker site did you use? Um, really, the only one is Poker Stars. Um, so, uh, you know, if you log into Poker Stars right now, which you can't from the United States anymore, um, it's pretty much the only country other than, um, I think, Iran and Pakistan. But, but uh, there's probably going to be like 200,000 people playing right now. So, and if you go to the second best, second um, biggest site, it'd probably be like 10,000 people playing max. Are you in the United States? I am currently, um, but I, I, I live in Phoenix and we have a tourist town um, in Rocky Point, uh, which is just about four hours away. So we can, I can go there and play online. What's the largest hand you have won, if you don't mind? Um, so yeah, it was, it was a, I generally play cash games, which is just like uh, for a much smaller amount, like you might be buy, buying in for like $200, $300. But um, I did in 2012, I think it was like in the summer or fall, I won a tournament and um, it paid out. It was a, hundred, a million dollar guarantee, but the first place, which is what I took, um, took a hundred thousand dollars. Did you ever try getting into the uh, World Series of Poker? Yeah, I played in two thousand five, um, and I played in I played that played the main event in two thousand five, and then I played in some of many of the other because the World Series of Poker has many different events. They might have like fifty plus events, so I played in some of the other events throughout the years. I did not win a bracelet, no, or nor did I make a final table, unfortunately. Wow, awesome presentation. There's a lot of, uh, I can see why those were like MIT majors that were gaming the casinos. Yeah. Deck, but uh, cool, cool presentation. Any other questions before we move on to fun, fun functions? All right. All right, thanks guys. Thanks Chris. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so let's start from terminal just to make sure we're still on board with all of this stuff. We'll CD to the desktop. Make a directory. Week two. Day two. CD into that directory. Um, make a JavaScript file. Cool, got it here. So just to recap, some things that we talked about the other day, functions. The way that we declare a function, we give it, we use the keyword var, we pick a unique name. I think I used my funk last time, so let's call it something else. Uh, forget it, we'll just call it my funk. <laughs> I should call it hello. We use another keyword, function. So we declare a variable, and then we're assigning it to this function value. We put the parentheses where we're going to, where our parameter list is going to live. And then we have open and closing brackets, which is where our function body is going to be. Um, ends with a semicolon. So JavaScript statement ends with a semicolon. Inside my function, I, I put my logic. I can say console log. Hello plus name. We will give this. And another quick recap question. What happens right now if I, if I hit Command-B and I build this in my node build system, what is going to get logged to the console? Um, currently nothing, because it just declares the variable. 
Exactly. Ben has got it. Nothing. And Jewel Marver one in the chat as well. I haven't hit the start button. This is a function definition. I have, I have created this function. I've defined it. I've said what I want to happen, but I have not yet hit the start button. I haven't told my computer to actually do anything. To start this function, you need to call it by name and use invocation parentheses. You need to invoke this function. That's what these guys do. So now when I hit command B, what's going to happen? It will write hello and nothing more because we don't give a parameter. Um, basically, and Raymond's got it in the chat too. He says hello undefined. So let's try it. Command B. Let's follow our directory node. What have I done? We'll work on that in a minute. But exactly, it's going to say hello, and because I did not pass it a name, it's going to say undefined. So here I can pass it a name, Luke. Oh dear. Start that out in a second. And it gives me a uh, hello, hello loop. So right now this function is, is giving us a value, but what it's giving us is called a side effect. Has anyone heard the term side effect versus return value before? So, a function has a side effect when it has sort of an effect on the outside world. So here, this console log is printing something to our console. It's having this kind of effect on the outside world. What if I did this? This would also be similar, a side effect. I'm having an effect on a variable in the outside world. And we're going to talk about why, we're having, why we have access to this variable in a second. But <clears throat> what this function is missing is a return value. A function is going to return undefined unless we specifically use this keyword, or the return keyword, and give it something to return back. Uh, this, on the other side of the return, is going to be an expression that gets evaluated. So I could say return like 5 greater than 7. But more than likely, we want it to just give it something that it, it's going to spit back automatically. So I can say just return true. Get this out of here. This too. So if I run this function, hello, let's say Ben. <laughs> What is going to happen? What's going to what's going to log in our console? Actually. Okay. We got a two, couple different answers. Anybody else want to throw in their guesses? Great. Raymond and Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel Let's hear from you. What, what, why do you think it's going to log that? Um, because the console runs and function logs in the console, or in the function. So hello, always logs hello, and in this case. And then also you're calling a console log of the result of the function, which is true. So you're going to get that as well. Awesome. Let's try it here. I didn't save it after I typed that in. <laughs> so I get hello Luke from this line, and then I get this, hello Ben and True. And what Gabriel is saying is that it's the, op the order of operations still happens here, the mathematical order of operations. So first inside this parentheses, hello Ben runs. We find this function hello, we pass it the parameter Ben, we get hello Ben. Once this has been evaluated, Kind of like variable substitution. The return value of this function gets substituted here for this whole function call, and what's left is the return value, which we've set to true. 
in this console log, this function, then acts on the return value of this previous function. Make some thumbs on the understanding there of side effects, which we had before we had this return statement, we just had side effects versus a return value when we added that. How about a question? How about somebody shout out something like, what if I did this or what if we tried this? Any, anything there? So return takes highest precedence. What if it is before the console log? Oh, good question. So Scott's asking, what would happen if we had done that? Let's get this one out of here. And um, let, let's guess, what is gonna print, what's gonna happen if I run this right now? It'll stop the function, Nick says true, true. Exactly, return statement exits function, function execution. Anything below the return statement just never gets evaluated. The function hits it and it's like, I'm done. I returned you something and I'm, and I'm done. So we can, why is it doing that? I'll be looking at that later still, okay. So let's see, there was another question in the chat here. It would exit the function, yes. What does return precisely do in the function? Return sets the return value. So functions, if I don't have a return, we've decided that it's going to set this return value to undefined. The keyword return gives the function a different return value other than undefined. Evan, did that answer your question? Or maybe I need more? I guess, okay, cool. Okay, so, so far we've covered function, how to define a function. Use the keyword bar, use a unique identifier, use the keyword function, open and closing parentheses, parameter list, open and closing brackets, and this is the body of your function. Second thing we've covered so far has been return values, which means you are using the return keyword. versus just side effects where we do not use the return key for it. Let's see another question here. So that is another way of writing functions, right? I've been doing it as function bar parameter and skipping the var declaration because I thought it was implicit. So Scott brings up a good point. There is another way that you're going to see functions written. I'm gonna show you what that way is. It's called, this is called a function expression. The other way is called a function declaration. The reason that we're going to encourage you to use exclusively this function expression for the time being is because the writing functions with function declaration statements can create some unexpected things in your code due to hoisting, which we are going to cover in just a couple minutes. But the other way that you'll see it, and if you guys have read Eloquent JavaScript, you're going to see it written this way a lot, is that he uses this function keyword first, um, then he gives it a name, then the same parameter list here, so name would go there and then the body of the function. So this is also another valid way to declare a function, a function declaration, but it is gonna have some unexpected things here happening, happening with your code. So we're gonna encourage you to use function expressions where you assign a function, you create a variable, and then you assign a function to it. Oh, let's see, I missed some chat. What if you returned hello name? Like the string hello name? Yeah, that's fine. I can do that. Then what would... Oh, no, like the function. Sorry. Oh, returned console log? So or if you re can you return the same function that you're inside of? Return hello? Yeah, with the name variable. Like just basically like return the same function that I'm writing? Yeah, would that create an infinite loop or? So what it would create is this, when I call hello, what the return value would be, would be another function, which that's kind of the essence of a topic for next week of higher order functions, like passing functions to functions and returning functions from functions. But if I captured this, then I would just have another function that does the exact same thing that I could call again. 
kind of that kind of is like that'd be a funky way to do it. There is a good purpose for for returning functions from functions, but returning the exact same function isn't typically one of them. Okay, I'm gonna delete some of this. But if we did say if we returned, oops. What are we actually returning here? Which is a type function function. Okay. So so line five, like what would actually get returned? What what would this what would line thirteen be printing out then? It looks like there's another conversation in the chat, but it would be this would get evaluated, right? This console log will get evaluated. And console log, it's also a function, it's a method, but it's a, which is the same as a function, but its return value is undefined. So basically, again, we would just be returning undefined. So we've kind of gone off on a couple tangents, but I just want to reiterate side effects versus return values and the function expression way of writing functions should be should be clear right now. Okay, we're going to move on to the next topic. So, I'm going to declare a variable var equals 1. I just saw this. So I'm declaring a function called change a. It doesn't take any parameters. And inside this function, Uh, okay. So on line 11, I've declared variable a set it equal to 1. On line 13, declared a function, change a. Inside the body of that function, I'm going to do some other stuff. On line 19, I'm going to invoke change a, which means I'm going to go back up here and I'm going to run the logic that's in the body of this function. What, what's going to happen on line 20? Or line 19 and 20? What are, what's going to get logged here and here? Two things are going to get logged. Jill Mar says two. Got a one, but I, I need two things that are going to get logged. One from line 19 and one from 20. Gabriel says two and one. Vivian says two and one. Elizabeth says two and one. Elizabeth, can you unmute and tell us why this is going to log two and one? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> on that first uh, change A, when it invokes a function, it goes in the function that sees that variable A is equal to two. So it'll print that as two, and then you have the console log of A, and A can go up to the top, the initial variable defined equals one. So you get two and one. Awesome. Um, Scott, just use the $64,000 word here, scope, scoping. How do you type and enter without typing in the chat? I'm not sure how I would that question. Um, so scoping. Scope is like, think, think about your, your application as a whole and every function within it as like, a, like people will say like a walled garden with a one-way door. So inside our entire our application here, which really just consists of these like 10 lines of code, the first thing I do is I create this variable out here in the middle of the open, global variable, var a equal to one. Then I declare a function. Functions have the unique ability in JavaScript, in ECMAScript 5 anyway, that they are the only ones where we can create a new little walled garden, a new little private scope for variables. So when I declare this new variable on line 14, var a equals two, it, it, inside of here, this console log a sees this var a and realizes that its value is two. It doesn't look outside to this a because it already finds one inside its own little walled garden. 
What if I didn't have this line? What would get logged down here? So I've got some some two ones, some ones, and some one ones. Sorry, one one, one one. Okay. Raymond, why is it gonna do be one one? If you're talking, Raymond, I can't I can't hear you. Sorry about that. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, yep. Okay, so change A uses the variable that's outside the function rather than inside. Right, so in our walled garden example, in, from, from inside this function body, we can look outside, we can go out that one-way gate and pull variables that are declared outside of this function scope that are in the global scope and use them in our code. If I did this, Let's ignore these lines of code. What am I gonna get? So here, we'll, we'll call chain J. What are the two things that are gonna get logged here? Something's gonna get logged from line 20 and something from line 21. Vivian says one and undefined. Vivian, you wanna tell us why? Yes, because uh, uh, we declare the value, uh, we declare B inside the uh, change A function, which is a, a local variable. And uh, it's now scope variable, so it's not tricking us. Exactly. This variable just lives inside this wall's garden. I can do whatever I want with it as long as I'm inside here. Console, console log it. I could increment it. But as soon as I step outside, oops, of this function's garden, I no longer have access to this little, to this variable. I can't reach in, I can only go out and grab things. Okay, more example here. What about now? What is going to get logged? What two things are gonna get logged? Somebody else want to throw their two cents in? Nick, unmute and tell us why you think two two. If you don't use the bar keyword, won't it just change the A from outside of the function? So it should print out two two. Exactly. I am not declaring a variable here. I am reassigning the value of an already existing variable. So in here, it's not. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for an A, right? I need to find an A so that I can reassign its value. If I look around in the scope of change A, I don't have an A to change the value of. So I jump outside the scope and I reassign this global variable A to this new value too. That is a, a side effect, right? That persists after this function has run and this now is a two. What if I had done this? That didn't exist. Anybody know what would happen in this case? Yeah, then uh, A is declared as a global variable, so if you can access this, or I access it with console.log A in the end. Right, so this is declared. Um, JavaScript uh, does it by itself because it is very fault tolerant and it thinks, okay, um, it's assigned here, but it's not declared before, so I um, create a global variable. Exactly. This is like a quirk of JavaScript. If you use in your JavaScript this thing called use strict, this will throw an error. It'll, it won't let you declare, basically declare a new global variable without using the var keyword from inside a function. But like Ben said, the way JavaScript is written, it will let you do it right now because what it says is 
oh, this is funny. You want me to reassign the value of A to two? I don't actually, I've never seen an A before, but wow, you must have meant to declare it earlier. You must have just forgot. So I'm gonna declare it for you and I'm not gonna make it local to your function. I'm just gonna declare it just as if you had done this. Um, it, it's, it leads to some unexpected behavior. Um, avoid it. So, so if you intend to declare a global variable, declare it globally before you try to switch its value. And like I said, if you're using use strict, it will, it will, this will error out on you. But something you need to know that if, that this is possible, if you do have this variable out here, you can totally change its value. And if you haven't already declared it, you will find yourself with a new global variable. So scope is where variables have meaning and what meaning they have. And functions are what create new little scopes for us inside our applications. We have this big global scope, and then every time we use this function keyword, we get our own little private walled garden with a one-way gate. We can reach out into the global scope and pull in variables that we want and manipulate them, or we can create little private variables like this var b and just keep them local to our function so that out here, they're not, they're not accessible to us. They're not gonna get confused with other things that they, they are private to this function. Any questions before we move on? Okay. So then B would be undefined, exactly. This would log undefined. Inside here, I can, I can see it. Console.log B. This would then return us like a two and a three. This would return us a two. All right. The last topic I'm gonna cover here, really briefly, before we break and send you off into groups, it's gonna be this one. Let's just copy this. Hmm. Let me see in the chat what's going to happen down here when we run this, invoke this function on line 34. I have a nine, an air, undefined, undefined. George, I see undefined. Can you unmute and tell us why you think undefined? Yeah, um, well, the way I understand scoping to work, it's going to go through inside of that function and it's going to hoist, it's going to know that there's a variable C that needs to be, um, that needs to be kept track of, but it's not going to record the value until, until, it, is it, until it gets there. So it's going to know there's a C, uh, so there's no error, but then when it logs out the C, the C doesn't have a value yet until next line, which is after the log, which it's assigned to the value of nine. Exactly, so basically what's happening, and what is this concept called, George? Do you scoping. familiar with like a word? Uh, scope. It's not scoping, because C is in the same scope, right? We decided that functions have their own garden. Oh, and hoisting, right sorry, yeah, hoisting. Hoisting, that's the magic word here. Yeah. Hoisting says that variable declarations so variable declarations, which is var c, are hoisted to the top of their scope. They are made available immediately inside their enclosing scope. But assignments are not hoisted. So basically, 
right? That is basically, this is the way that the function is written. We're saying, hey, I have this variable C. Then we're saying, hey, console log C. But we're not assigning it to its value until down here on line 33. This is a really crappy way to write code, right? To, to ask your, com your computer to do something. Hey, console log C, and then have your variable declaration below it. The lesson of hoisting is this. If you have variables that are important in your scope, they should be declared at the top. All of your variable declarations, if, if I had another function thing in here, anything that's gonna be oops, declared as a variable inside your scope and used should be declared at the very top. Um, but th that, that is the essence of hoisting. It should not be an issue for you coding if you are using good style by putting your variable declarations at the top. But it is kind of one of those gotchas of JavaScript. So it's good to know that variable declarations, right? This is the declaration part of this statement. They're hoisted to the top, R, C. It's just imagine it being at the top, but the assignment is not happening until the line down here where it was written. Kind of a lot that we actually went through this morning. Any questions? Any, anybody want to shout something out? So that would work differently in function declarations. No, the function declaration creates the same scope. The difference between function, function declarations and, the func and function expressions. So right, this is a function expression. And we can see the same thing happening, right? This declaration, log c, is hoisted to the very top. So right away, so right away I see a log c. It's like kind of like Peter's like, like, like saying they ought to this spot for this variable log C. Log C. It's not till down not here that it actually here, realizes, it's oh, hey, this is what's hey, going, on. going on. Function declaration. Oops, not, I keep doing that assignment type of thing. This whole thing gets hoisted to the top. So basically, if I tried to call log C up here, Scott, let me delete this. If I tried to invoke it up here, it would be undefined. If I had a function declaration, let's say log x, I can call it up here and it would not err because this whole thing would have been hoisted to the very top. It's macros, yes, because you have all these walled gardens that can be like nested inside each other and they're all living inside your entire application. So your entire application has one big scope. So I'm, I'm declaring these basically in the global scope of my function. So that's why it's getting hoisted to the top of that scope, which is like, for our intents and purposes, this is a one file application. So it's, it's getting hoisted up here and everything has access to it. Just um, keep this maybe as a thought, like, okay, this is why variable declarations are different than, sorry, function declarations are different than function expressions, but use function expressions. Like prefer function expressions over function declarations. Any other questions? I'm gonna to try to write over one minute over my ideal time cap. So I wanna take questions before we break you off into groups to work. I have a, I have a question. Yes. In the log C function, so does that mean it will print nine? No, it will print, as it's written right now, it's going to print undefined. Oh, okay, okay. We had, we had, it was initially written like this. So what'll happen is that it'll hit this log console C, but as far as it knows, all that has happened so far is that this variable C has been declared, but it has not been assigned. So, so when it hits this line, it doesn't know, it has not yet realized that C is going to be assigned nine. All it knows is that basically it's been declared. That declaration gets, ho gets hoisted, but assignment does not get hoisted. Any other questions? I might have missed what that Y was relating to. Uh, I was just wondering why you choose uh, function expression over the declaration. 
uh, because it basically makes you write your code, like have your variables at the top. And this log X then is going to get hoisted, like I said, to the top of the whole scope. So it might be up here somewhere where you don't necessarily want it yet. Okay. So um, this is a little bit shorter of an amount of questions, of pr prompts for you guys to work through in the curriculum, but um, pair up and start working through them. Don't hesitate to reach out to Zan and I. Um, play around though in your consoles, like definitely see what things happen. This, r run some of this code and see what, what you get logged out and where, how you can um, change things that are in, inside your function scope and outside your function scope. I also think these topics, scope and hoisting, are more thoroughly covered later. So this is more of just like an introduction. You won't necessarily need to master these concepts for today's lessons. Just start thing, things to start thinking about um, as, you, as we start diving deeper and deeper into, into functions. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna cut you guys loose to go work in your groups. Quick question before we break off. Yes. Are we uh, submitting the code using the, the website, the, white, um, the remote prep website? You know, we're not. Um, initially, this website was built by one guy at Hack Rector who um, thought he was going to set it up so all the instructors could get the code, but he just kept getting it all and he didn't, didn't change it. <laughs> he just put it off. So it doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, you don't need to submit it on that way. Um, it's going to be up to you after we do this GitHub lecture how much code you want to push to GitHub. I would su I'd suggest like starting to get in the habit of like creating GitHub repos and pushing even your practice problems to it just to kind of get some of the muscle memory of, of doing it that way. But um, it's certainly not required and it's nothing that like Zan and I are going to go to your GitHubs and check and make sure that you're doing everything. It's just, it's just a, for your own edification. <laughs>